Thank you, Bonnie, for that song. Uh, very powerful words. Um, thank you to Pastor Dan and Anita for hosting me this weekend. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, they have fed me this morning, given me a warm bed to sleep in. And I found out last night that uh, Anita's dad used to be my pastor back in Ontario, in Canada. So I was able to FaceTime with them last night. So thank you so much to the both of you. It's so nice to see your family again. Brought back old memories. Um, I am here this weekend to share something I'm very passionate about. It's uh, called Thrive. And for those of you who came last night, I had an amazing time. Really nice to see and visit with some of the members from your community. I remember John and Miranda and Darlene and I think it was Laura, Laurie. Yeah, I got a chance to meet some people from your community and uh, thank you so much for those of you who came. I, I heard that you were blessed and I was blessed just being there and sharing these things that have really helped me in my life. And I wish so much that I learned the things that I'm sharing during these meetings. I wish I knew them when I was younger because I feel like my life would have been so different. But that's why I'm passionate about that now because I don't think it's too late. I think that we can have an amazing life with God's help. And uh, this is why I do what I do. I want to show the value that God has for people's lives. And so if you haven't had a chance to come out last night, I want to invite you personally to uh, tonight. We're going to be looking. Last night, we looked at how to grow in your personal life. We looked at, you know, the question, where am I? Taking a self-assessment. And then we looked at, where am I going? And then the third question was, how am I going to get there? And we also talked about some barriers. We talked about fear. We talked about procrastination. And we talked about self-doubt. Tonight, we're shifting gears, and I'm going to share with you tools on three more questions. But each of the tools that I'm sharing tonight and the questions tonight are all around relationships, how to thrive in your relationships. What's really interesting to me is that the key to thriving in your relationships isn't necessarily understanding someone else better, although that's part of it. The key to healthy relationships is actually understanding yourself better. And so the three tools I'm sharing tonight are the absolute best tools that I have learned to help people thrive in their relationships by understanding themselves better. So please come tonight, bring a friend. We're going to have a great time for um, during tonight's second night of Thrive. And then of course, tomorrow we're wrapping things up. Something happened to me last summer that was a milestone for me. I turned 40. Yeah, I'm getting old, I know. <laughs> and, uh, but something that I, I really cherished from last year during the summertime was that my family got a chance to visit me all the way from Ontario, Canada. That's my family. Uh, we took them to the coast. That is Ecola State Park. You can see Haystack Rock somewhere down in the distance there. Absolutely love it. And it was special because they weren't able to visit us since I moved here back in 2020. And it was uh, because of COVID, uh, obviously, and uh, I think so they finally were able to visit and see where we lived. And it was just a special moment for me. And when I crossed that threshold, going into my 40s now, there's always a moment, right, when you hit certain moments in your life where you start to really question why you are where you are, and if you're really satisfied with your life the way it is. And different moments will trigger that for certain people. For me, it was this past summer. I looked over my life and I realized like five years ago, if you would have told me that today I would have been preaching in Oregon on Sabbath morning at a church in Lebanon, I would have said, what are you talking about? There's no way. And here I am. Are you surprised that you are where you are in life? Or are you like, no, I'm pretty much, yeah, I know exactly why I'm here. 
I believe that each one of us is where we are in life because of three things. Number one, I started to talk about this a little bit last night. Three reasons why you and I are where we are right now. Number one is our choices. Whether good or bad, your choices have landed you where you are in life right now. Sometimes it's not our choices. Sometimes things happen to us that are outside of our control. And they can hit us. It's, it's, it's an accident, something unplanned that can derail us and set our lives in a completely different trajectory. But there's a third reason, and that is by providence. There are times in my life, and I'm sure that you can probably say the same if you look back, there are times in life where it seems as though there was a divine wind in the sails of your life as you cross the open ocean. And it's almost as if you can say, I know now looking back that it was God who was leading me down that journey. Have you ever had those moments? For me, it was, it was one of these moments was so obvious only later. It always, hindsight's 2020, right? In, in 2020, when COVID hit, everything got shut down, including the borders up to Canada. It was very difficult to cross the border, and I really wanted to visit my family. There was one way that I could, though, that was almost the easiest way, no questions asked. I know, because I've done it. <laughs> and it was if you had COVID in the last 90 days, they didn't even ask you any questions. If you could prove to them that you had COVID in, in the last 90 days, welcome home, cross the border. No lines, no, almost no security, you just walked right in. While everybody else had to go through massive lineups. And I went home in 2021 because I got COVID that Christmas and I, w I got a chance to go visit my family and celebrated my mom's 60th birthday up at Camp Frenda. That's like the Big Lake version of Ontario. It's beautiful up there in the Muskokas. Uh, Dan and Anita, you know where that is. Beautiful place. And we celebrated my mom's 60th there. We had about three to four feet of snow. It was just beautiful. The lake was, oh, it was just beautiful. And while I was there, my friend who is the, the lead ranger, the head ranger of the camp, he was, he was telling us, oh, you know, our associate ranger is going in a different direction and we're looking for an associate ranger. And I just jokingly said, hey, mom and dad, you should apply for this job. Wouldn't it be great to work at Frenda? And they laughed and they laughed. Oh, it would be great. My mom was looking to retire sometime and my dad was looking for a new line of work. Long story short, three months later, and since that time, my parents are the associate, uh, assistant rangers at Camp Frenda. I mean, and look at the way it started. I believe that whole plan, that whole thing started because I got COVID. If I would have never gotten COVID, I would have never gone to Canada to visit my parents. We would have never been able to go to Camp Frenda to celebrate my mom's 60th there. I would have never spoken to my friend, known that there was an opening, and then jokingly just said to my parents, you should apply for the job. Has there ever, ever been a time in your life where you, when you look back, you can say, yeah, I can see now that God would, even though this was a messy time in my life, God was still working through my life and through my experience. There is a story in the Bible that I want to look at during our time this morning because I love this story. And really, it's a story of someone who had a lot of ups and downs. And a lot of the ups and downs were, yes, a result of their own choice. And some of the experiences that this person had, yes, it was a result of an accident. But when you look back, you can't help but see that even through it all, God was there. God was guiding this person's life. And even though it didn't go as, as planned, God still worked things out. The person I want to discover again the story of and, and just look at this morning is the story of Jonah. Most of you, if not all of you in this room, have heard about Jonah before, heard about a man surviving in the belly of the fish. If you've never heard it before and you're here this morning, you think that this has something to do with Pinocchio, uh, I got a surprise coming for you. But for those of you who have heard it, I want to challenge you this morning to look at this story again with fresh eyes. 
I want us to read the first chapter together to kind of get a sense of what's actually happening and just try to read it and, or listen to it as if you're listening to it for the very first time. And what I'm going to challenge you to do is also to, to look for themes. I want you to look for words that repeat because those will be very important to uh, how we unpack this story and the lessons that we can learn from it. And so open your uh, Bibles with me, your phones, uh, your tablets, your devices, whatever you have with you, to the book of Jonah, chapter 1. Jonah, chapter 1. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. Jonah is a hard book to find sometimes, so you may have to go to the front and look at the exact page, but I want to read it. Uh, let's, let's do that. Uh, just listen as, as I read and, and follow along. And let's read the first chapter. Jonah chapter 1 starts like this. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down to it, into it, to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest part of the ship and lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And uh, to, of what people are you? So he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Verse 10, Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's sake, and do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea uh, ceased. From its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. The last verse, verse 17, says Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Interesting story. There is so much for us to unpack, and we don't have time to go through everything today, but there is a a few things that I want to bring your attention to, and the first one is that word there in verse 17. It says, now the Lord had prepared. The Lord had prepared. This word is a governing word in the Hebrew language, which means to commission. This is a word that a king would use when he would send an emissary or a, an ambassador or, an, or a messenger with a message to another king or another kingdom. This is a word that is used for people, not for an animal, not for a creature. And here it says that God is commissioning an animal. Would have caused people who heard this for the first time, raise an eyebrow. What do you, what do you mean? It's almost like in their minds, as they're hearing this story, they can almost imagine God turning to a fish in the sea and said, uh, God saying, hey, hey, fish. 
And the fish says, yes, Lord. God says, listen, I have a job for you. I want you to go pick up a guy named Jonah. Where is Jonah going to be, Lord? He says, I will tell you where he's going to be. I just need you to go, and I need you to remember one thing. This is very important, fish. Swallow, don't chew. Okay, it's very important. Swallow, don't chew. It is a very odd story. If you were listening to this story for the first time, you would almost chuckle at this. Be like, really? Is, this, is it even possible for someone to go down into the belly of a fish and actually survive? You know, there's been a lot of people that were actually really worried about figuring out the answer to this question. And I did, did a little digging myself to see if this is even possible, if this is something that's ever happened before. And I came across an interesting article, a very, very old article about a man named James Bartley who was part of a whaling expedition in the Falkland Islands in the, um, during the 19th century. And while he was out there with his whaling team, he accidentally fell overboard off the boat, and a whale came and swallowed him. His friends thought, well, that's it. He's done. He's gone. You know, sorry, James. But a day or two after this, apparently the whale had specific markings on it, so they knew which one it was. They went out and saw the whale again. And they caught the whale, and they cut him open, and out comes James Bartley, alive and well, to, to tell the story. Now, hold on a second, folks. Hold on, hold on. Because I did some more digging and found out that this is actually just a legend. It wasn't true at all. <laughs> they made it up. The whole story was made up. <laughs> but you see, the point of the book of Jonah, the story of Jonah, is not to prove that there is such a fish in the world that if you were to get swallowed by it, that somehow you would be able to survive for three days and three nights. The point is, is that it would take a miracle for something like this to actually happen. And that's important because at the heart of our faith, we believe in a God that is real and a God that is all-powerful. And can perform miracles, like walking on water, and helping the deaf hear, and the lame walk, and the blind to see, and raising someone from the dead. Nothing is impossible to God, and if He can raise people from the dead, and walk on water, and open the eyes of the blind to see, and the deaf to hear, do you think it would be difficult for God to keep a guy in storage in the belly of a fish for a few days? Absolutely not. And I want to encourage anybody who is hung up on what kind of fish this is to just move on. Because that's not the point of this story. That really isn't the point of this story. If you do, you will miss the point of this book. And here is the point of the book of Jonah, in my opinion. I believe that no matter what's, what you're going through in life, remember that God is up to something great. Remember I told you when we read the story to look for themes, words that were repeated in this story. I'm going to ask you a question. What word is most associated with the acts of God in this story? And I'll give you a hint. It's written on the screen behind me and it's in big letters. <laughs> What's the word? <laughs> Great. Here are some examples. Jonah, uh, sorry, God sends Jonah to the great city of Nineveh. The Bible says God sends a great wind and produces a great storm. The pagan sailors are converted through great fear. And then God sends a fish to pick up Jonah in the sea. And what adjective does it use to describe the fish? A great fish. God has a plan. And it's great. God has a purpose for Jonah. But Jonah begins to do his own thing. And he starts to mess up the plans that God originally had for his life. And so if the main word associated with the acts of God in this story is great, what would you say would be the word associated with the acts of Jonah? No, it's in the story, and I want to show you it right now. It's actually the word down. Watch. When God says, 
Jonah, go to the great city of, uh, of Nineveh. The Bible says that Jonah goes down to the port city of Joppa. Then Jonah hops on a ship that is going down to Tarshish. While he's in the ship, Jonah goes down into the bottom of the ship to sleep. Then he is thrown overboard and he goes down into the stormy sea and he ends up down in the belly of a fish. Do you see the direction of his life as he's turning away from God? Which direction is he heading? Down. When Jonah finds himself in the belly of the fish, Jonah finds himself finally hitting rock bottom. You cannot get lower. In the mind of people during this time, hearing this story, you cannot get lower than the sea. They did not have scuba diving gear or snorkeling equipment during this time. And so in their mind, anything that goes down into the sea does not come back. He is as good as dead. Story over. They grow up, grew up reading and hearing things uh, read like this, once again, you will have compassion on us. You will trample our sins, talking about God, under your feet and throw them into the depths of the ocean. What goes into the ocean doesn't come back. And guess what Jonah does when he hits rock bottom? Exactly. He prays. And how do we know this? Because basically all of chapter 2 is his prayer to God. And this is important because up to this point, we don't have any record of Jonah ever talking to God. He's just too busy, busy running in the opposite direction. But here, when he hits rock bottom, he prays. Now, let me ask you a deep question. Pun intended. Did you get that? Yeah, sorry. sorry, sorry. Let me ask you a question. Why did Jonah pray at this point? I'll tell you why, why I think he prayed. That's part of it. You know what else? I think it's because, listen carefully, he had nothing better to do. And it, yeah, it's, it, it, we could chuckle at that, but it's also very humbling. Do you know why I think it is very difficult for us to have a consistent prayer life with God? It's because we have too many other things to do. We have so many social media platforms we need to check, so many emails to get back to at work, so many things to research and, and buy on Amazon, Am I stepping on some toes here? So many shows to binge watch on uh, Netflix. We have so many other things to do. Whatever it is, we don't pray because we have other things to do. And the same was true for Jonah. He doesn't talk to God until he's in a place of desperation in the fish in the bottom of the sea. And sometimes that happens to us as well. We go through life. And many times we can spend days, weeks, months, sometimes even years without talking to God. And something happens in our lives where we get hit by something unexpected, a storm. Something derails us and we get to a place of desperation. And we're sitting there beside a hospital bed and crying out in desperation in that moment to God. And while the whole first chapter of the book of Jonah is all about Jonah taking action, you look at this story and you realize it's Jonah making the plans. It's, it's Jonah has the resources. It's Jonah going places. But then the storm hits and everything in Jonah's life comes to a grinding halt. But then the second chapter is just him praying. And if I, have, if I had to summarize the first two chapters of the book of Jonah, this is how I would just, uh, summarize it. There is a man in the stomach of a fish in a storm by a boat in the bottom of the sea. And listen carefully. And it is there that this man named Jonah 
discovers God. Hmm. You ever felt like Jonah before? Ever been running in the opposite direction, running from something? Your life is just careening out of control and you hit rock bottom. You have no options. And I believe the story of Jonah is here to remind us that sometimes it is in those moments of desperation when we turn to God that we learn the most about the heart of God. That we discover God in a way that we never discovered Him before. That no matter how far we've run, no matter how many bad decisions we have made in our lives, the, no matter how dark the journey gets, God is there with you. And if you just trust Him, He can turn your situation around. It may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, it may be. Sometimes it takes time. And sometimes it happens in a way that you don't expect it. But you will make it. How do I know that? How do I know that? Because the Bible says that God delivers Jonah on the third day. This was very important for the hearers and the readers of this story during that time. Because if you look all throughout the Old Testament, you have story after story, example after example of God. Anytime God steps in and intervenes, it usually happens when he saves people on, on behalf of God, I mean, it always happens on the third day. For some reason, the third day is very, very important to how God intervenes in the lives of his people throughout the Old Testament. And so, as the hearers and the readers of this story are going through this story, they say, ah, yes, Jonah is in a bad place. But the third day is coming. We know how this story is going. We know that the third day is coming. And what they're expecting is, oh, yes, somehow Jonah is going to get delivered. I bet you they're, they're talking, thinking it, it's going to be the angel Gabriel. He's going to come in. He's just going to beam him up in the middle of a prayer. Somebody else is saying, no, 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 no. You know what it's going to be? It's going to be a fiery chariot. I've heard that one before. That's what's going to happen here. Jonah is going to be delivered in a miraculous way. But that's not what happens in this story, is it? It says in Jonah chapter 2, verse 10, And the Lord commanded the fish, and it what? Vomited. Barfed. Jonah onto dry land. Not exactly what we would have expected looking at other stories in the Bible of how God delivered His people. And the writer is making sure that we know, that we realize that Jonah wasn't just dropped off gingerly on a beautiful beach like the Oregon coast. He took a ride on the Food Shuttle Express. And he is not standing there as this, this heroic figure that we would have expected in gleaming white robes and just glowing because of his glorious experience. He's standing there covered in seaweed cocktail and whatever else large fish like to eat. He looks ridiculous. Jonah ought to be the hero of this story, but he's not. He is a regular person just like you and just like me. And I think that this is a good news for us to remember, a good Good lesson for us to remember because a lot of us go through life thinking that we are the hero of our own story. You're not the hero of your story. You know who the hero is of your story? Jesus is. God is the one who gives us purpose and he will deliver us. Listen, you and I both know that life doesn't always turn out the way you planned it. And sometimes things happen in your life and you feel like Jonah on that shore covered in seaweed cocktail. But in the end, God always wins. Let's face it. Uh, part of the reason why we, we love reading the story of Jonah is because there's another character that we can see between the lines of this story as we read it. Now think about it. Jonah, we're told, is from a place called, uh, a town called Gath Hefer. 
just down the street from another place called Nazareth. You know anybody from Nazareth that was a prophet, somebody pretty important in history? Let me ask you this. Jonah was sleeping in a boat in the middle of a storm, and because of his actions, a storm was calmed. Does that remind you of anyone else who was asleep in a boat one day, and because of his actions, the sea was stilled in a great storm? The name Jonah means dove. And it also means given to a beloved one. Does an experience ring a bell when someone came up from the water and the Spirit of God descending like a dove and a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son? Toward the end of his life, Jesus said, I mean, people pressed him over and over can you just settle this once and for all, Jesus? Are you the Messiah? Tell us, please, just settle this. And Jesus gave them a sign, didn't he? What did he call that sign to prove that he was the Messiah? The sign of what or who, I should say. The sign of Jonah, Matthew 12, verse 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The message of Jonah is a little foretaste of the victory of Jesus. The one who comes and meets us in our lowest places in life and tells us that death and sin and sadness and anxiety and stress and cancer and the common cold, whatever you're facing right now, that all of that in the end loses and God wins. And that someday soon he's coming to take us home. <clears throat> this is the story of Jonah. It's the story of God meeting us in our lowest place and reminds us that God is up to something great. I want to close with this. Because of the persecution during the uh, times of the early church, <clears throat> The early church uh, couldn't just meet anywhere in the open to worship God. They were afraid. They were being persecuted and hunted down like animals, and they were fed to lions as sport in arenas. And so they had to get creative with how they were going to meet and how they were going to worship God together. And they had small groups in different places. And one of the places that they met were underneath the streets of Rome in a place called the catacombs. Some of you know what this place is. Some of you may have even visited the catacombs at one point in your life. The catacombs were tombs underneath the city streets of Rome. And you can go there today and see this place. This is where they had to meet with candlelight among the dead because of fear of persecution above ground. The first art inspired by Jesus is not art that appeared on great cathedral walls and frescoes on the ceilings of places like the Sistine Chapel. No, it was art that was etched into the walls of tombs in the hidden catacombs under the streets of Rome. And which Bible character, which Bible figure do you think is found etched on the walls of the catacombs more than anyone else? It's not Moses. It's not the one who led the people of Israel out of Egyptian slavery and gave them the law of God. It wasn't even King David, the great king. It wasn't Father Abraham. You're right. It was Jonah. Jonah is etched everywhere in the wall, on the walls of the catacombs. And I think it's because they got it. They understood the point of Jonah's story. 
They understood that no matter how difficult life was for them, no matter how low they had to go to escape persecution, they knew that the third day was coming. They knew that things like death were coming to an end, that resurrection was coming on the third day. They knew that Jesus was all over the holy and yet at times unexpected story of Jonah in the scriptures. And so I want to leave you with this. Three life lessons from the book of Jonah. Number one, we all have Jonah moments. Moments in our lives where we perhaps know what we ought to do and we run in the opposite direction. Maybe you know what God is calling you to do and for some reason you are just running from it. Maybe it's just simply a relationship with God himself. Maybe as I was reading the story and we were talking and discovering the story of Jonah, you realize that you maybe want to make a decision today to stop running. You don't have to wait for a disaster to hit your life to turn back to God. God is waiting with open arms. You can stop running. Second point It's never too late to pray. It's never too late to pray. I want to, cha- can I challenge you this week? Just one week, seven days. I'm going to check in with Pastor Dan if you did this, but uh, um, one week, I want to challenge you to do something. It's the beginning of 2024. I want to challenge you to talk to God this week. And I'm going to challenge you. Here's the, here's the, here's the challenge. I want to challenge you to pray or to just simply talk to God, here's the catch. Do it before you pick up your phone in the morning. Oh, that's more difficult. I know that if I look at my phone in the morning, my day is gone. And so I'm going to challenge you before, when you wake up in the morning, before you go to reach for your phone, just have a short conversation with God this week. And see if that doesn't change your life in one week. Third and final lesson is, I want to remind someone here this morning that God is up to something great. And someone may be here this morning who needed to to be reminded of that because you're going through a really difficult time. You needed to be reminded this morning that God is willing to meet you at your rock bottom. That God is willing to meet you in your family. God is willing to meet you at work. God is willing to meet with you at school, in your classes. God is willing to meet with you when you cry by yourself in your closet because you're too afraid for anybody else to see you. God is there. And he's reminding you today that he is up to something great. And deliverance is coming. Just hold on just a little longer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the story of Jonah. Thank you for the reminder, God, that you are always there with us. Sometimes we do silly things. We run in opposite directions when we know we, you're just calling us back to your heart and into a, a relationship with you. God, there are some of us here today who want to make a decision to just stop running. We pray for that person. I pray for that person. That you would speak to their heart and give them the courage to turn to you and say, okay, God, okay. Uh, I'm going to go where you lead this time. My life is a mess and I just, I need you to guide my life. I want to pray for people here this morning who want to accept the challenge of speaking to you this week in the morning before they even check their phone. Some of us have gone for weeks and months maybe even years without talking to you. And this week, we're going to challenge ourselves to speak to you before we do anything else throughout our day. So we pray for the Holy Spirit to just wake us up in the morning and to remind us to do that this week. And God, once again, thank you for the promise that no matter what we go through in this life, someday soon you're coming to take us home. 
And that's great news. Thank you for the truth today, God, that you are up to something great. Thank you for that hope. We are holding on to that hope right now. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.